Good afternoon, everybody. I'd like to call to order this uh, Tuesday, March 28th, 2023 meeting of the Pierce County Council. It is uh, 3.02 p.m. Madam Clerk, will you please call the roll? Yes. Councilmember Campbell? Here. Councilmember Kruber? Here. Councilmember Denson? Here. Councilmember Herrera? Here. Councilmember Hitchin? Here. Councilmember Morrell? Here. Councilmember Mello? Here. Here are seven members present, Mr. Chair. Thank you. All members are present, which is a quorum. I'll soon ask us to uh, stand for the Pledge of Allegiance led by Councilmember Denson. Um, and I'm going to ask us to stay standing for a moment of silence. And today's moment of silence is uh, dedicated to uh, two different incidents of gun violence. One is a Everett police officer who was shot in the head but is thankfully recovering um, from respond, responding to an armed robbery investigation in the city of Everett um, about six days ago. Again, thank goodness, uh, recovering, but very serious incident. Uh, the other is uh, uh, six individuals plus the perpetrator uh, in Nashville, Tennessee, including three young children who died at the hands of gun violence at a Presbyterian um, school in uh, Nashville. So, uh, Councilor Denson, will you please lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance and let us please remain standing for a moment of silence. To the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, liberty and justice for all. Item four on our agenda is approval of the agenda. Is there any uh, objection to the agenda as presented? Not seeing any. Um, Vice Chair Campbell, I think we have um, a yes. appointee from item number two on Zoom with us. We do. Uh, I move uh, approval of the consent agenda, uh, moving item number two to section seven. And approving it with those changes. Second. It's been properly moved and seconded to adopt the consent agenda with the exception of moving item number C2 to section 7 of the agenda. Madam Clerk, will you please call the roll? Councilmember Kruger? Aye. Councilmember Denson? Aye. Councilmember Herrera? Aye. Councilmember Hinton? Aye. Councilmember Morrell? Aye. Councilmember Campbell? Aye. And Council Member Mello. Aye. The result of the roll call vote is seven ayes and zero nays. Thank you. On a vote of seven ayes and zero nays, the consent agenda is adopted. That brings us to item number six messages from the executive, judges, or prosecuting attorney. We have one. Uh, the executive did sign ordinance number 2022 81S, the Marine Howard Affordable Housing Act. That now brings us to section seven, proclamations, awards, and appointments to boards and commissions. Let's do the appointment if we can. Um, Councilmember Morell, for a motion, please, on 2023-33. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I move for consideration R-2023-33. It's been properly moved and seconded to adopt resolution R-2023-33. Madam Clerk, will you please read into the record? Proposal number R-2023-33, a resolution of the Pierce County Council confirming the appointment of one new member, Chris Moore, to the Pierce County Flood Control Zone District Advisory Committee. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Moore, welcome. Uh, good to meet you. We would invite you to introduce yourself and share briefly why you wish to serve on uh, the county's Flood Control Zone District Advisory Committee. Please go ahead. Hi, everybody, and thank you for uh, for having me here today. Um, really, this comes from uh, growing up in the area. Um, several generations of my family have grown up in the Ording area, and flooding, as you all know, is, is a big part of growing up in Ording. And uh, to be able to have that impact, uh, to be a part of the process, is really just something that uh, it's an honor to be able to be involved with. And I look forward to uh, 
doing everything I can to make this a safer place to live for everybody. Well, thank you, um, Mr. Moore. Thank you for your willingness to serve um, and uh, the good work that everyone has been doing for some time to help protect the property and life in Ording and, and the Greater Valley. Uh, I'm not seeing any hands at this time, so we'll open this up for a public hearing. Is there anyone in chambers wishing to provide uh, public comment on this appointment resolution? Not seeing any, Ms. Persons, anyone online? For any member of the public wishing to make public comment, press the raise hand icon in Zoom or star nine on your telephone keypad. Not seeing any, we'll close the, excuse me. Go ahead, Ms. Persons, I'm sorry. I see one hand. Um, first, we have caller ending in 035. Looks like you're muted. You can press star nine to unmute. I apologize, star six to unmute. Okay. Yes, can you hear me? Yes, we can. We see that you're unmuted. Great. Please go ahead. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you, council members. My name is Hannah Thompson Garner, and I am here this afternoon on behalf of the Northwest Animal Rights Network and all its members in Pierce County. We ask that you please recognize the inherent legal rights of excuse, the Southern excuse, Resident Orchids. Excuse me. I, sorry for the confusion. We're on a public hearing related to an appointment to an individual to the Pierce County Flood Control Zone District Advisory Committee. Uh, we'll take a public hearing on the proclamations in just a little bit. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else online wishing to provide comment on the appointment of Chris Moore to the Flood Control Zone District Advisory Committee? Not seeing any, we'll close the public hearing and bring it back to council. Are there final remarks by council members? Council Member Morell. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Just like to applaud Chris for stepping forward and volunteering. I think today's um, approval of the resolution is the easy part and uh, the hard work is, is yet to be done. Serving on these committees as a volunteer, um, you know, this council could not function without uh, <clears throat> the citizens of Pierce County volunteering for these different committees and boards. And uh, I just appreciate uh, those that do step forward and give their time and talent uh, to these endeavors. So appreciate Mr. Moore and look forward to communication pertaining to the Pierce County Flood Control Zone District. Thank you. Thank you. Council Member Kruver. Thank you, Chair. I'd just like to agree with Council Member Morrell and express my gratitude to Mr. Moore. I very much appreciate you coming forward to be on this committee, your knowledge of the area and your common sense on how things work and, and knowledge of the laws of nature. You're going to have a lot to offer to this committee. So thank you so much for stepping forward on this. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Vice Chair Campbell. Thank you, Chair. And uh, a question for Mr. Moore. Do you, do you work for the city of Ording? I, I see that on your uh, Zoom screen there. No, it's my Zoom account. We've been doing lots of meetings for some projects, and so that I had a city voting background because I've been working on behalf of the city. Okay, so you work on behalf of them? Okay. All right. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Moore, I, uh, I served on this advisory committee for a number of years, and um, as Customer Morell indicated, it is a lot of hard work, a lot of important work to advise the County Council or the Board of Supervisors um, on, uh, on really Im important matters. I, and so uh, really appreciate the diverse perspectives and all that we're trying to protect, both life um, and property. Uh, and uh, I particularly it, uh, have enjoyed that the Flood Control Zone District has done its work with a multi-benefit mindset, uh, meaning um, the environment, water quality, property, and life, um, other infrastructure like transportation infrastructure, uh, wastewater infrastructure. There's a lot that's in harm's way and a lot that we're trying to protect um, while trying to uh, protect our way of life and protect our environment all at the same time. That's what we mean by a multi-benefit approach. 
and really uh, expect that the flood control zone district would continue to take that mindset. So looking forward to hearing what you bring to the table. Seeing no other remarks, Madam Clerk, will you please call the roll on proposal number R2023-33. Thank you. Council Member Denson. Aye. Council Member Herrera. Aye. Council Member Hitchin. Aye. Council Member Morrell. Aye. Council Member Campbell. Aye. Council Member Kruger. Aye. And Council Member Mello. Aye. The result of the roll call vote is seven ayes and zero nays. On a vote of seven ayes and zero nays, the resolution is adopted. Thank you again, Mr. Moore, for being with us and the work you're going to do. Thank you. We're going to come back to uh, section, uh, the rest of Section 7, uh, Proclamations, Awards, and Appointments. Um, we have Proposal Number R2023-31 in front of us. Councilmember Herrera for a motion. Chair, I move Resolution Number R202331 for approval. Okay. It's been properly moved and seconded to adopt Resolution R2023-31. Madam Clerk, will you please read? Proposal Number R2022-31. A resolution of the Pierce County Council honoring vet Vietnam veterans and proclaiming March 29, 2023 as Vietnam Veterans Day in Pierce County, Washington. Thank you. Councilmember Herrera to read this into the record, please. Thank you, Chair. A resolution of the Pierce County Council honoring Vietnam veterans proclaiming March 29, 2023 as Vietnam Veterans Day in Pierce County, Washington. Whereas the Vietnam War was fought in the Republic of Vietnam from 1961 to 1975, with the United States involvement largely ending with the signing of the Treaty of Paris, which secured the release of all American prisoners of war held in North Vietnam and the withdrawal of the United States Armed Forces from South Vietnam, culminating with the standing down of the Military Assistance Command Vietnam on March 29, 1973. And whereas approximately 2.7 million brave United States Armed Forces members served during the Vietnam War, with more than 58,000 paying the ultimate sacrifice, and more than 300,000 members sustaining wounds, both physically and mentally, and over 2,500 remaining unaccounted for as prisoners of war, missing in action, and reported killed in action, but having never been recovered. And whereas Pierce County has a responsibility to honor our veterans with an estimated 30,400 30, Vietnam veterans calling Pierce County home and 111 of the 1,047 Vietnam War fatalities from Washington State being from Pierce County, they gave their lives in service to our nation and our community. And whereas in 1982, Vietnam veteran memorials were dedicated both nationally in the District of Columbia, along the National Mall, and locally in Olympia, Washington, on the campus of the Washington State Capitol, to honor and to commemorate those members of the United States Armed Forces who died or were missing in action in Vietnam. And whereas throughout history, different generations have faced their own challenges and, war, uh, challenges and wars, for the generation that fought the Vietnam War, this was especially true. In a time of social and political unrest, the members of, of our armed forces took on the task and gave themselves to duty, uh, to the duty at hand. For this, we owe our Vietnam veterans the utmost respect. And whereas the Pierce County Council is grateful for the faithful service of Vietnam veterans during their military service, as well as their continued contributions to our community. Now, therefore, be it proclaimed by the Council of Pierce County that Wednesday, March 29, 2023, is Vietnam Veterans Day in Pierce County, Washington. And we encourage all citizens to commemorate this day by honoring our Vietnam veterans and showing appreciation for their sacrifices and the sacrifices of their, sam of their families. Adopted this 20th day of March uh, 2023. Thank you, Councilmember Herrera. Um, we are so honored to have uh, three veterans um, with us today, Vietnam veterans with us today. We have, uh, and I'm going to invite you to the podium to accept this and introduce yourself and say a few words. We have Buck Mudd, who served in the Air Force, Carlos Almeida, who served in the United States Army, and Jorge Ramirez, who, who served in the United States Navy. Please come to the podium. We're so honored that you've made time to be with us today. Uh, 
Come on, brothers. I'll go first. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much for this honor. We uh, rise uh, in appreciation of this effort that you're making for us. Uh, my name is Jorge Ramirez. I am a uh, retired Chief Petty Officer from the United States Navy. I served in the Navy from 1964 to 1983. And uh, uh, it was a, indeed an honor to be able to serve during that difficult time. We won't go into the process of uh, all of the discomforts that happened during those, that time when it was time for us to come home. Oh, darn, I said I wasn't going to do this. Mm -hmm. But as Paul said, 58,000 didn't. Thank you for this day. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Carlos Almeida. I was uh, in the lower ranks of the uh, Army. I was an E-5. I volunteered not so much for the country as for my family. We, I come from a family that was poor. We finally found a place where we found a job, East Chicago, Indiana. And a couple of years later, my dad got so sick, we had no money. So the only thing I saw is the war. That's, I, I knew that they would need people, and I volunteered. I volunteered because my mom was the first time that she had a house. And my dad being sick, we were going to lose it. And I prayed to God that I was doing the right thing. I guess I did something good because I'm back here. And I got to thank you, everybody, for an honor like this. I know I don't deserve it, but it's still an honor. And I thank you very much. There's a lot of people out there that didn't come back. I lost two men out there. And it is the hardest thing to do. Can you imagine coming back home and telling their mom and dads they're gone? It is very hard. So I don't consider me a hero. I had something to do, needed something to do, and I did what had to be done at the time. I have regretted a lot, but thanks to this honor, we'll keep on fighting. Thank you so much. Thank you. I'm sorry. Thank you for having us. <clears throat> My name is Leroy Mudd. I'm a retired master sergeant in the Air Force, and I served in Vietnam on Charlie Row. I, what, my job there was getting the supplies on the airplanes to, so they could go to the, uh, or be sent out to the bush for the people that really needed them. Uh, I saw a lot of people, some of my friends, not make it back. And that's the, that's the hard part. I went there as a cripple. That is, <clears throat> I had a broken toe. My big toe was broken whenever I was in training to go in the combat training. And the doctor said, you go anyhow. So I did. I went as, as a cripple. I, I did nothing compared to the people that were there in the bush and suffered all, all of the, the uh, heartaches and everything. But for me, it was, it was an honor to 
represent my country and my family and my fellow men. And if I had it all to do over again, I would, indeed. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you to all three of you for honoring us with your, your presence and your many sacrifices. We're going to have to do just a little bit of protocol before we do final remarks and a, and a vote on this and before we ask you to join us up here to take a photo. So please allow us a, a little time for what we need to do before we get there. Uh, is there anyone, uh, we have to open this up for a public hearing. Um, I, is there anyone in chambers wishing to provide uh, testimony on this proclamation? I'm not seeing any mispersons, anyone on the line? For any member of the public wishing to make public comment, press the raise hand icon in Zoom or star nine on your telephone keypad. Hold, hold on, sir. Let's see if there's anyone online. It, no one, Miss Persons? No, no hands. Please state your name for the record, and you, so, you have three minutes to make your remarks. I'm Eric Musica, born and raised in Tacoma. Is that, um, I got so lucky. I have a successful family, so I didn't have to like pay for college and whatnot. But if you do have to go through that route and you're trying to find your ways to make your way, I, I would join the military. Mm. Now you got free uh, college and whatnot. Um, I hope Biden pulls the strings that, uh, you know, college becomes less expensive and whatnot. But um, that's why I was thinking about uh, what I could uh, share. What, I, what are these uh, upstanding men? Thank you for your service. Thank you very much. I'm not seeing any others, so we'll close the public hearing. We'll bring it back to the council. Final remarks by council members on this resolution. Council Member Kruver. Thank you, Chair. I, I just want to say thank you for your service for doing that. I was just out of high school when things were winding up there, and I really had no understanding of what you all went through. But as I'm aging, I have so much more appreciation for that, what you have done, and, and you're my heroes. And thank you for being here, and we are the ones who are blessed for you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councilmember Herrera. Thank you, Chair. Um, I really thank the Council for um, allowing us to get on the docket here and uh, be talked about here today in Pierce County. I, I, the people in the audience know who I am, but the people who are listening, um, you know, the Vietnam veterans are my hero. They are my heroes. Um, mainly because uh, their generation were, are, was my father, my uncle, aunts, that generation, they're all Vietnam veterans. Um, so you showed me what right looks like. And then when I joined the military 33 years ago, the Vietnam veteran was my commanders and my command sergeant majors who were mere young lieutenants and privates 20 years before in the steamy jungles of Vietnam. So they showed me what right looks like and they made damn sure when I came home from my first combat deployment in Iraq that they were at the airports making sure I was welcomed home. They were also there when we pulled out of Afghanistan just about a year ago, when I was feeling angry about how we pulled out, feeling, you know, why did my comrades die in that country? Why did we even go there? And a Vietnam veteran overheard me and said, I understand. So the Vietnam veteran has been, has molded who I am today. And even how I think on this bench, I heard someone say that they're not a hero, you are a hero. The impact that you gave after you came home, you're a testament of life after the military. You've helped people uh, who were in the military during the first Gulf War from the mistakes of Vietnam. We never made those again. You taught uh, the leaders who are in the military today. Um, your impact is more than you could ever know. And I thought it was really important for society to, to know that you are not forgotten. The Vietnam veterans are appreciated, and you are heroes. So thank you for uh, doing all that today. This is all about you, the Vietnam veterans. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Councilmember Denson. Yes, thank you, Chair. Well, I'll echo the comments that um, my colleagues have already expressed, and thank you for your service. I had family that um, served in the Vietnam War as well, and very proud of their service. Um, I'm proud of, proud of all the Americans that, that chose to serve um, for a variety of reasons. 
I'm also very cognizant that there are um, a lot of Vietnam veterans that are still suffering. Certainly there was a lot that suffered during the war. You mentioned some of the um, men and women did, that did not come home. Um, but we hear stories all the time about Vietnam veterans in particular who are still suffering for some, from some of the impacts, um, not only of what they, they saw overseas, but what they experienced back home. And, and that's something that, that we address um, as a council, ways that we can help um, these heroes, as Councilmember Herrera um, referred, these heroes, they deserve our support, they deserve our, our help. It's time for us to make sure that, that, that they feel comfortable and accepted and, and that we address their needs as well. So I agree with Councilmember Herrera and, and all the others that spoken that, that you are true heroes. Um, and I also want to do a shout out to some of the great organizations like VFW and American Legion. I don't know if you all are part of some of those groups that really help support one another and, and have that camaraderie that I think is so important, especially to people who have served. So thank you to those groups. Um, and thank you again for your service. Thank you. Vice Chair Campbell. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, gentlemen, for your service and for being here. Uh, my father, Vietnam era veteran, and really taught me growing up about duty and service. You know, I think of my, uh, when we do many of these, uh, I think of my uncle uh, that was in Vietnam, and for a long time we didn't know where he was. It was, it was uh, on some very tough missions, and he, he made it back, thankfully, and he does not talk about it. He will not talk about it and we respect that, but it talks about the burden that he carries. And I know so many carry those burdens, and um, I just appreciate uh, that we continue to honor and put to the forefront and to honor those who carry those burdens. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Uh, in closing, we uh, it, it is such a... Um, important time when we can invite veterans into these chambers and honor you and uh, show our respect for your many sacrifices um, and many who you've who aren't able to be with us and, and like previous speakers I think often about not just honoring and respecting our veterans with uh, words um, though that is very important we mean these words very sincerely I think often about showing our respect and our honor through our investments in our in our actions about how to make sure that um, we have resources for uh, veterans to start new businesses um, to uh, have the housing and the dignity um, the health care the behavioral health treatment that they um, have earned and um, everything else that, that that they've earned so uh, I, I really appreciate it when we put action behind our words um, and really invest in the veterans who have uh, given so much of, of their life and their families. So um, thank you again for being with us and allowing us this time to uh, reflect and uh, honor you and honor many others who are not in this chamber today. With that, Madam Clerk, will you please uh, call the roll? Councilmember Herrera? Aye. Councilmember Hitchin? Aye. Councilmember Morrell? Aye. Councilmember Campbell? Aye. Councilmember Kluver? Aye. Councilmember Denson? Aye. And Councilmember Mello? Aye. The result of the roll call vote is seven ayes and zero nays, Mr. Chair. On a vote of seven ayes and zero nays, the resolution is adopted. Please join me in a round of applause. <laughs> Gentlemen, we would invite you up here to take a photo with us and allow us to hand you the proclamation. So please come forward.
right. And one, two, three. I'm going to get one more. Got it. Thank you. Thank you again for making time to be with us for Vietnam Veterans Day. Our other proclamation today is uh, Resolution R 2023-30. I'm going to ask uh, Councilmember Denson for a motion. Yes, thank you, Chair. I proudly move Proposal R 2023-30 for approval. Second. It's been properly moved and seconded to adopt Resolution 2023-30, Madam Clerk, will you please read into the record? Proposal number R2023-30, a resolution of the Pierce County Council recognizing the inherited rights of <clears throat> settling resident orcas in Pierce County, Washington. Thank you. Thank you. Councilmember Denson to read this into the record. Thank you, Chair. Whereas the southern resident orcas are culturally, spiritually, and economically important to the people of Washington State and the world, and have been a sacred spiritual species to the tribes of Pierce County since time immemorial, and whereas in May 2018 the affiliated tribes of Northwest Indians of the United States passed a resolution recognizing the orcas as revered relations for which there is a sacred obligation to ensure they are treated in a dignified manner that reflects tribal cultural values that have been passed down for countless generations. And whereas the community of southern resident orcas were listed as an endangered species in November 2005, but despite legal protections for nearly two decades, orca populations continue to decline and are critically endangered with just over 70 orcas left in the wild. And whereas the orca's survival is dependent on healthy and functioning ecosystems and the remedy of identified major factors in the decline of orcas, including declining salmon habitat and runs, increased competition for prey, toxic pollution, climate change, population growth, increasing vessel traffic and noise, and whereas through collaborative work with the Puyallup Tribe of Indians, the Muckleshoot Indian Tribe, the Nisqually Indian Tribe, the Squaxin, Indian Tribe, Salmon Recovery Lead Entities, local watershed councils, and other federal, state, and local partners, Pierce County is working to implement policies and programs that promote orca recovery through efforts to address impacts to critical areas, remove fish passage barriers, treat and reduce stormwater impacts prior to entering Puget Sound, implement a salmon habitat restoration and protection program, plan for climate resilience, prevent human waste pollutions through a mobile pump-out boat program, and more. And whereas over 20 countries, dozens of local communities in the United States and several tribal governments have recognized that nature has inherent rights and that human society has the responsibility to protect and steward nature in a manner consistent with our interconnected relationship. And whereas nature and all living beings, including the orcas and the ecosystems upon which they depend, are recognized as possessing inherent rights, including the right to exist, flourish, evolve, regenerate, recover, and be restored. And whereas the rights of the orcas include, but are not limited to, the right to life, autonomy, culture, free and safe passage, adequate food supply from naturally occurring sources, and freedom from conditions causing physical, emotional, or mental harm, including a habitat degraded by noise, pollution, and contamination. Now, therefore, be it proclaimed by the Pierce County Council that the Southern resident orcas have these inherent rights and urge action by local, state, federal, and tribal governments that secure and effectuate the rights of the Southern resident orcas and of the ecosystems upon which they depend. Adopted this 28th day of March, 2023. Thank you, Councilmember Denson. I'd like to invite Twyla Slynn to the podium to make a few remarks. Okay, can you hear me? We can. Okay. Um, on behalf of the Legal Rights for the Salish Sea and the Earth Law Center, 
we'd like to extend our gratitude and appreciation to Marty Campbell and Robin Denson and the rest of the Pierce County Council for supporting this proclamation recognizing the inherent rights of the southern resident orcas. Legal Rights for the Salish Sea has been working with Michelle Bender since 2018. Michelle is the ocean rights expert and we're extremely grateful that we've had the privilege of working with her on this campaign. We realize that the rights of nature movement is still in its infancy in the United States, but it is growing rapidly in other countries. Corporations in this country have rights that can be legally defended in court, but non-human animals and ecosystems have no rights. By signing this proclamation, you've shown other communities in the state of Washington that we value our southern resident orcas and are committed to seeing them thrive once again. And you are joining a growing group of communities. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ms. Lynn. We're going to open this up for a public hearing. Is there anyone in chambers wishing to provide comment on this proclamation? Anyone in chambers? I'm not seeing any, Ms. Persons, anyone online? For any member of the public wishing to make public comment, press the raise hand icon in Zoom or star nine on your telephone keypad. And first we have Heather. Good afternoon, Heather Nicholson. And uh, just a quick word um, to say thank you so much for adopting this proclamation. Uh, I think you guys did a really wonderful job. Um, with, with your version of it, and it was a, a really great reading of it. And I just want to thank everybody um, who worked on it. Um, Chris Kevorki and Legal Rights of the Salish Sea, Earth Law Center folks, Twyla, um, and just anybody who supported it. And I appreciate all of the efforts that you have going for the Southern residents down there. Um, so yeah, kudos, just really, really appreciate it. And it felt very authentic, thank you. Thank you. And next we have caller ending in 035. Caller ending in 035, there you go, you're not muted. Hi, thank you. Um, as I said before, my name is Hannah Thompson Garner. So great to talk to you all so soon again. Um, I'm speaking on behalf of the Northwest Animal Rights Network and all its members in Pierce County. Um, we had asked uh, that Pierce County recognize the inherent legal rights of the Southern resident orcas. And I just wanted to thank you all for, for signing on to the declaration and for doing so. So thank you so much. Thank you. No more hands. If you know their hands, we'll close the public hearing and bring it back to council. Final remarks by council members. Vice Chair Campbell. All right, I'll jump out there. I didn't know if council member Denson would want to go first. Uh, Wayne, in bringing this forward, and my, my mind goes back to when we think of our resident orcas or the orcas that we see here in Puget Sound, my mind goes back to the uh, incident several years ago that many of us followed of the mother orca who uh, lost her baby and for 17 days swam around the Salish Sea uh, trying to keep the baby above water. So when we look at animals and particularly uh, animals like the orca and you see them grieve like we do, we see their uh, emotion and their the, the word that comes to mind is their humanity or their orcianity, I don't know. But, uh, uh, but you see that it's an individual sentient being. And you have to wonder who speaks for them. I uh, remember in uh, some uh, class I took on law, you know, much of the American law system is actually based on the British law system and it's all based on precedent. And back in the what many times are referred to as the Dark Ages, Middle Ages, uh, animals would often be brought before a court, uh, accused of many things, be it um, destroying a fence, something like that, and they were afforded a lawyer to defend them in court. This has long been a process that uh, 
anything accused, anything governed, gets a voice. And that uh, that, that voice uh, should be, there's actually a good film, uh, French film called The Advocate uh, that uh, I used to rent out at my video store that's worth seeing about the defense of a pig, but accused of murder. Um, uh, but it got me thinking about where we're at and what, what are rights here and how do we discern that. And I, so I, I thought, you know, what did our, you know, our founding fathers, fathers, we often look to them for guidance. And what did they have to say? And actually, I think it was pretty clear. Uh, we all, I'm, I'm sure, know the Declaration of uh, Independence starts with, when in the course of human events it becomes necessary for one people to dissolve the political bands which have connected them with another and to assume among the powers of the earth the separate and equal station to which the laws of nature and nature's God entitle them. Opening line of the Declaration of Independence says man is equal to nature. It goes on, and we, we know this, we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, and that they're endowed by their creator, the creator aforementioned as equal with nature, certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, pursuit of happiness, that secure these right governments are instituted among men, deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed. I believe we pass laws that govern orcas and other animals. What is their consent? Who speaks for them? What voice should they have? So when we talk about um, uh, how this is uh, intersecting and inherent rights, it, it's about inherent respect, about making sure that we understand and make sure that we're allowing a voice at the table, an advocate uh, for those at the table. Because despite our founding fathers setting us in one direction of being separate and equal station to the laws of nature and nature's God, we, we lost our way. And indeed, I think uh, it was Richard Nixon that really spoke to that uh, when he worked at uh, establishing the EPA. Clean air is not free, and neither is clean water. Um, through our years and past carelessness, we have incurred a debt, and now that debt is being called. And that was his 1970 State of the Union address. Uh, I don't recall it. I wasn't born yet. But it uh, uh, tells you how long we've been working on this and how bad that we had it. And he, um, he, he goes on in the State of the Union Address, and, and I would say this in speaking with us up here, when we look at how we're caring for the Sahali Sea, the orcas, the salmon, really all elements in there, and the uh, problems that we know that it has, um, Nixon went on to say, restoring nature to its natural state is a cause beyond party and beyond factions. It has become a common cause for all people of this country. And I would submit for this county that um, the Puget Sound, Sahelia Sea, is incredibly important to this county. Um, and that this is one step of having respect for those who were here long before us. If our uh, indigenous friends and neighbors want to uh, show us the way with this respect, I think it is our duty to follow the leadership that they have shown. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Councilmember Jensen. Yes, thank you, Chair. Um, I'm very, very proud and excited about this proclamation. I want to thank the cities and counties that led the way, um, the city of Port Townsend, Langley, Gig Harbor, the counties of Jefferson and San Juan. I'm sorry we weren't first. <laughs> but very excited to, to lend our support. Um, this really expresses our, our values, I think, and our, our intent, our beliefs, our intentions. Of course, we want to do a whole lot more than just express our intentions. And, and I think, as, as I mentioned in the proclamation, you know, I'm very proud of what Pierce County is doing and has done. You know, we've shown a, a big commitment to improving the environment for the ORCA, but there is still a lot to be done. Um, there's a number of factors impacting the population of ORCA. We talk about the reduction of salmon populations, pollution, loss of habitat. I was just on a West Sound 
um, Salmon West Salmon Ecosystem Recovery Board meeting, and they were talking in regards to salmon that in 1880, Congress called attention to the reduction in um, the salmon population and wanted a study done in 1880. It wasn't until 1990 that a variety of salmon were placed on the endangered species list. A hundred years later, this is a problem that you know, we've been noticing and understanding that it has impacts on not only nature but on people um, for a long, long time. In the Pacific Northwest, I know we really feel a connection to the orca. It would be hard to even envision the Puget Sound and, and our Pacific Northwest without thinking of the orcas being in it. So I know I feel a personal connection, and I know um, a lot of my constituents and, and folks around this area do. So I'm very, very proud that we're, we're making this statement and doubling down on our efforts to make sure that you know our, our amazing orca survive and thrive. Um, as we mentioned in the proclamation, we are interconnected. So what we do for nature is not only good for nature, but it's good for us as well. And I'm very happy to be part of that. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Denson. Councilmember Morell. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Chair. I appreciate the comments. I appreciate the proclamation. I appreciate the culture um, and the history that uh, orcas bring. You know, as somewhat of a senior member on this council, and I'll date myself, I remember the days back in the 60s and 70s where we allowed capture of killer whales and uh, orcas and how it devastated um, the uh, southern uh, residents here, uh, declining by more than 40 percent. Those were days that we look back and I'm embarrassed to be part of that, but it happened. It's history. We learned, we corrected, we made the change. We as humans are responsible to treat all creatures humanely. And that is a value that I have um, and have always have. If you yell spider, I'll run and catch it and release it. I won't step on it. But I think in our zeal um, to deal with these issues, we lose track of what our responsibility as humans are. And one of the things that in, in the proclamation, it does um, comment a, lo a lot of the environment issues. And I acknowledge that we've come a long ways in how we treat our environment. And just in my own research, when this came forward, I said, I'm going to look and check and see what, what studies have been done pertaining to orcas and why the decline, especially the southern residents. Um, and it was interesting because as I was looking at this, there was a new study that was just uh, revealed by University of Washington and uh, NOAA pertaining to why the southern residents are having challenges more than any other population of, of killer whales. And it's inbreeding. It is inbreeding of the southern residents to the point where sons are breeding with mothers which weakens the genetics of that particular pod. They're living much shorter than their northern um, residents. They haven't evolved and adapted as quickly as other orca populations have. They basically consume Chinook salmon which other populations have diversified their appetites and have pursued other 
type of food sources other than just one particular uh, species. And I feel bad for the mothers. For some reason or other, the southern pods end up, if they have a male whale, that guy never leaves. He stays with his mother. And his mother, because she's a nurturer, shares 50% of all of her food with that male son till she finally passes away. And then the male is lost. He doesn't know what to do without his mother. So I just thought it was interesting looking at we can do a lot of things. You know, we've breached dikes, we've removed dams, we've created wetland habitat for Chinook salmons. The orca's most important food. They've limited commercial fishing to try to ensure prey for the whales. They've made boats slow down, keep further away from the animals, reduce their stress and quiet the water so they can better hunt. All the other orcas have figured it out, but the southern pods haven't. We can make all the things environmental. We can try to do, and we have. We have done an incredible job on our built environment, on limiting what goes into our breeding uh, and spawning rivers. We've made headway. We've done a lot of things. And some things are out of our control. And this is a case where unless something can be done, um, you know, I, I don't know how to deal with the whole inbreeding issue. And, uh, I mean, statistically, they're the only group that has not quadrupled their population since 1971 and they continue to decline. And that's why they did the research and found out the genetic problems with the southern pods. So for me, I respect them. I have responsibility to treat them humanely, but to assign rights, I, I, I can't do that. So I will not be supporting uh, this proclamation even though I appreciate uh, what the makers of the proclamation are trying to do. Um, so thank you for indulging me. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Councilmember Herrera. Thank you, Chair. And I, too, appreciate the, this proclamation and the spirit of it. Um, I've always been fascinated with the orcas. Um, you know, I've seen them visit here in Commencement Bay. I've, I've seen them out in the Narrows. I've seen them in Henderson Bay. Uh, I've seen them over by McNeil Island. Um, in fact, I have a statue of orcas in my office um, to remind me of the resilience and the, uh, the delicate nature of these creatures. You know, on the water as an individual, uh, it's easy to feel the spiritual and the cultural connection to the orcas. When you can smell the water and you're moved by the, the tides, um, you, can, you can totally feel it. You can kind of understand it. You can have that connection. You know, um, Recognizing their place in this world is very, very important. Uh, but declaring orcas to have inherent rights, I, I think is, it's, I don't know what the intention of that is. I think if you um, give them inherent rights, it might di dictate policy um, on how we do things, forbidding some practices and behaviors and encouraging or demanding others. Um, I agree in the protection of orcas and the ecosystem and everything that goes along with it and a lot of what was said in this proclamation. But understanding uh, the culture and the spiritual of these animals, I, I do take pause in supporting um, this proclamation. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Councilmember Coover. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I have to say I've, I've never been blessed with seeing the orca live in nature. So I, I resort to videos and I was watching one where here's this little ankle biter rescue dog that is smelling for scat for the for the orca, and it was fun to watch. And there's so much attention that it, that is brought to these animals that are, are really quite something. But I, I I appreciate the stories. It's a lot of good knowledge to have, 
And uh, I want to share again my appreciation for the maker of this. I know her heart is in this. And uh, but when I look beyond the heart and I look into the history of this movement, I see, you know, a different meaning. I see a different picture and a different future. And perhaps we want to call those the unintended consequences. So while I'm not able to support this resolution, I, I want to share that in the, the beauty of the animal. In fact, I was told I kind of look like an orchid today. <laughs> so regardless, you know, thank you for, for the opportunity for this. It's just not something I'm able to support. But thank you, Chair. To be clear, I said you look like an orchid because you're wearing black and white. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Th thank you for these uh, r remarks. Um, I'll close our uh, debate um, by uh, very much appreciating the, uh, the sponsors and the art, uh, authors of the proclamation um, and many who have continued to advocate for uh, um, the recovery of this endangered species. I think we have, unfortunately, 76 southern, rec southern residents left in existence uh, in Puget Sound or in the Sailor Sea, excuse me. Um, uh, and uh, as uh, Vice Chair Campbell was remembering uh, a few years ago, uh, one mother whale in particular captivated the world's attention. It made worldwide news. Um, the mother whale's name, we, we've, we humans, uh, at least here in Puget Sound, have called uh, that mother Taliqua. Um, and Taliqua carried her dead uh, calf of uh, for close to three weeks um, and definitely captivated the attention of, of folks around the world. Uh, I, I was working for a conservation organization at the time. And as I mentioned, often, uh, like, like many of my colleagues, I'm, I try to be a person of action, uh, not just words. Um, like we've discussed with our Vietnam veterans, the actions that we take to demonstrate our respect is incredibly important. So too in this area. So in my previous life, captivated by the attention of Taliqua carrying her dead calf and seeing that we only had 76 southern resident orcas left, we created something called um, Orca Recovery Day. We started it here in, uh, in Pierce County. It, it was a movement that grew throughout the Northwest, and there's folks in Northern California up to British Columbia who, who now participate in Orca Recovery Day. And it was a day of action, a day of doing the things that are called out in the proclamation to help primarily with the recovery of their major food species, Chinook salmon, um, and, and other salmonids. So uh, improving water quality, improving fish habitat, all these things that get at action to why our southern residents are in critical danger. And we know that they've been in critical danger for some time, uh, for decades. We know that they're in critical danger because for a long time we've degraded um, the habitat of the food source of the uh, entire ecosystem, their water quality, they've been under stress for all kinds of reasons, again, as highlighted in the proclamation. Um, and we've gotten to this super critical uh, point where now we have uh, 76 uh, orca whales left um, of the southern resident pods. You know, I, I often think, too, of you know, how important this apex creditor, this, this real apex um, creature is in our food chain um, but how this incredible apex predator, predator is also a red herring. Uh, it, it's a, not, 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 excuse me, not, not a red herring, but a canary in the coal mine. I'm getting my analogies mixed up. It, it's it's a, a, a canary in the coal mine, right? It's when, when the orca population has um, depleted so significantly, it's a sign of how sick Puget Sound is. We, we look out the window and we can see the, the majesty of Puget Sound. Um, it might look really beautiful to the naked eye, but when you start uncovering the many ways that it is sick, it has profound effects not only to the creatures that live in it, but um, to our economy and to those of us that, um, many of our cultures that depend on it for their culture, for their way of life, for their food. Um, so it, it really is um, an indicator of not only the health of this one species, but it's about the health of of Puget Sound and the health of all of us species um, living here. So I appreciate uh, the proclamation for bringing um, light and attention to what we need to continue to recommit ourselves to, to uh, recover Puget Sound and recover this, uh, um, recover this really majestic species. So 
With that, uh, Madam Clerk, will you please call the roll? Councilmember Hinchin? Aye. Councilmember Morrell? Nay. Councilmember Campbell? Aye. Councilmember Kruger? Nay. Councilmember Denson? Aye. Councilmember Herrera? Nay. And Councilmember Mello? Aye. The result of the roll call vote is four ayes and three nays. On a vote of four ayes and th three nays, the uh, resolution is adopted. I invite everyone to uh, join me in a round of applause. Um, Twyla, we would invite you up here for We do have uh, proposal number 2023-7 before us. Council Member Morell for a motion. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I move for consideration proposal number 2023-7. Second. It's been properly moved and seconded to adopt, excuse me, to adopt ordinance number 2023-7. Madam Clerk, will you please read into the record? Proposal number 2023-7, an ordinance of the Pierce County Council Restating and modifying the Pierce County Small Business Innovation Matching Grant Program. Thank you. Mr. Taylor, to introduce the item to Council. Yes, uh, thank you, Hugh Taylor, Council staff. The uh, proposal before you begins at page 36 of your packet. This proposal modifies the Innovation Matching Grant Program to allow the program to be expanded to Pierce County cities and towns that have a population of less than 8,000. This program is administered by the Economic Development Department. By way of background, the Council established the Innovation Matching Grant Program through a budget appropriation and proviso in the fall of 2021. It was established in response to the economic disruption caused by the COVID-19 pandemic. A $3.45 million is appropriated for the program. This program was created to assist small businesses in unincorporated Pierce County recover from the pandemic and become more resilient. The program is funded by the American Rescue Plan Act. It provides grants to small businesses and is focused on one-time capital expenditures. Maximum grants available through the program are $20,000, subject to an equivalent match by the business recipient. Since the launch of the program, approximately 342 applications for grant assistance have been received from Pierce County small businesses with 136 of these applications being determined to be eligible for assistance. A statistics on the businesses that have received assistance can be found at page 50 of your electronic packet. As of March 2023, approximately $1.7 million of grant funding has been obligated to approved and funded applications. However, approximately 206 applications for small from small businesses were determined to be ineligible for assistance with many of these businesses being ineligible due to the business being located within an incorporated city or town. Financial capacity remains within the program to support businesses. The program modification before you would expand eligibility under the program beyond the unincorporated area and allow businesses in, in cities and towns having a population of less than 8,000 to apply for grant funding. 
With this change, businesses in 10 cities and towns would be eligible to apply for funding. Those businesses or those cities and towns are listed in a table within the staff report in your packet. Uh, I'll note that this proposal did receive a due pass recommendation from your Economic and Infrastructure Development Committee at its March 14th meeting. The proposal is before the council today for final consideration. I'll note that we do have Ms. Uh, Betty Capistani, the Director of our Economic Development Department, present today. Uh, Ms. Capistani can help answer questions regarding the program if necessary, as can I. So, Mr. Chair, that concludes my uh, introductory remarks on this proposal. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Taylor. Ms. Capistani, anything to uh, add on your behalf or the department's behalf? No, thank you for being here. Thank you for continuing to work on this. Councilmember Kitchen. Thank you, Chair. Um, Director Capistani, I actually do have a question. I was just wondering if, if I may, Chair, um, is there a plan to reach out to the businesses that were turned down because they were incorporated um, cities and now might become eligible since I'm assuming you have their contact information. For, for the record, I'm Betty Capistani, Director of Economic Development. Um, thank you for the question. Those that would be eligible um, that are in this new pod um, uh, would be reached out to. So with this um, uh, um, change, and I want to thank you for this because during CARES, you our council helped pivot when we needed to pivot on our different um, ordinances that we had before you and so we thank you for the pivot for this and from what we can tell these communities that Hugh mentioned have about 3,500 businesses so um, that's the outreach that will go to those businesses many of them do have direct connections whether it's through their um, city or town or through their association so, so they're, they're very connected to get information and resources out to them so yes we will do that thank, thank you. you Councilmember Morrell thank you Mr. Chair Ms. Capistani, I'm just curious, um, you mentioned part of your outreach. Um, how are you going to communicate? Um, and when you do do that, uh, you know, please send us a link. But you're going to hopefully open up the grant process. And how are you going to notify? We, we do a variety of different ways. One of them, we send it all to you. Um, so, so those of you that have uh, cities and towns that are applicable, you get to send that out to them. Um, we also do email blasts out. We have about 10,000 on our mailing list, but then we will we'll work with all of the cities and towns because they're specific entities that are um, included in this outreach. And we've already kind of pre-done a little bit of work to let them know, and I believe a few of you are also hitting the streets because some of them are calling me um, asking when they can... To, announce it and so after it's uh, fully signed um, we will be able to uh, put that announcement out okay follow-up question sure. mr. Taylor uh, talked about the program can you talk about what you've seen as far as in investments that have been out into the community the different types and what qualifies for an innovation grant Great question. I can do a little bit. I did a whole bunch at the committee meeting, so I have to d go back to what, February 14th for that. Um, and so what we've seen is actually really, uh, this is all capital investment, so it cannot be used for ex um, operating expenses or payroll expenses. The business has to let us know what they're going to do ahead of time. And then we have to make sure it actually uh, matches. Um, and then when they're done, after they paid for it, they get they apply for a reimbursement. And we see all the receipts. We see it's cleared the bank, all of those pieces. Um, a lot of our communities have done things tied to investments, whether it be um, fixing up an area for seeding, whether it be fixing a tractor. We've had a lot of our farming community, actually our agriculture community is one of the largest users of this uh, grant process. So there's been a wide variety of different things businesses have used. The average, we will match up to 20000 so they would have to spend forty. The average has been, when you look at over all of the 124 to date, that have been funded is about 14000 So with this average, we, we know we would get, be able to help at least 3.5% of those 3,500 businesses um, uh, for, for this next round. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Vice Chair Campbell. Thank you, Chair. So excited to see this continue to evolve. It was, I think, literally three years ago this week 
that we rolled out our first funding for small businesses in Pierce County before CARES Act was even a thing. Uh, the pandemic hit and we were back with a budget release with money for food banks and small businesses. Mm -hmm. March 24th. Leading the nation. Um, CARES Act came much later and uh, on the heels of that now the ARPA funds that we're using here. Um, so uh, through that we've gone out and we've talked with businesses to see what they need and then we've responded and then we've innovated, changed, pivoted, uh, built and expanded throughout to really have maximum impact to many of our small businesses across this county. And I think it, it shows that uh, when we were reviewed on how we, we as a county uh, spent our CARES Act funding, we were recognized as one of the top counties in the nation for the balance of balancing the needs of public health and uh, taking care of our businesses and making sure our human services were stood up and having a holistic approach. And so um, for many, when they got the ARPA funds, it was one and done. They spend them in one place or there. We're continuing to innovate. And as long as we continue to have those funds, we will continue to innovate uh, for the small businesses across Pierce County and for all of our residents. Thank you for your work on this. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. I don't see any other hands at this time. Thank you for answering our questions, Ms. Capistani. Thank you for in introduction, Mr. Taylor. Uh, this is a public hearing on Ordinance 2023-7. Is there anyone in chambers wishing to provide testimony on this ordinance? I'm not seeing any Ms. Persons, anyone online. For any member of the public wishing to make public comment, press the raise hand icon in Zoom or star nine on your telephone keypad. We'll close the public hearing and bring it back to council. Are there any final remarks by council members? Council Member Kruver. Thank you, Chair. I just want to say, Council Member Campbell, I can't believe you remember that. That's like, wow. And I just want to say thank you for bringing this forward. I think it's brilliant. And I feel very fortunate to be able to sign on to this to support it. Thank I just, it's awesome. And, you know, for the small areas like where I am, we don't have a lot of opportunities for, for businesses. They, you know, they are limited to the number of constituents that come out to use their businesses. So this is awesome that they can grow a little bit. And again, it's a brilliant. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Council Member Morrell. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Mr. Chair. I echo some of the comments that Vice Chair Campbell said. I mean, you know, we, we've been through the process. <laughs> and uh, how quickly we had to pivot and uh, make decisions on just the survivability and sustainability of businesses during the pandemic. And some of the creativity that came out of that came out of your department, the small but mighty Department of Economic Development. Um, and uh, I still hear from restaurant owners of how those dollars kept them in business. Um, and, uh, you know, if, if you've actually have been an entrepreneur and a business owner, um, you know, uh, when you can get grants like this, um, it, it's the difference between whether you're going to keep your doors open or shut your doors. We are now coming out of the pandemic. Um, the American Rescue uh, dollars have helped with that. Um, as Councilwoman Kruver said, um, a lot of these small jurisdictions didn't get very much money. Uh, in ARPA and what they did get a lot of them had to invest it in, in just keeping their little small towns and cities going uh, much less push it out for economic development so as Director Capistani said I've seen several nice looking orange tractors uh, that uh, these dollars have helped buy to cultivate more acreage, um, to be able to help 
um, expand businesses. I've seen coffee roasters um, that uh, have have uh, have and will be purchased. I'm hoped uh, to to expand small little roasting companies, and I've seen the ability for capital to be used to open up patios to put structures in that bring people together again uh, to just listen to live music and and uh, enjoy the things uh, that we used to enjoy. So for bringing this forward for these small little towns and jurisdictions, I, I, I think it's, it, it's just another step that we can do to acknowledge uh, that our small businesses are important to Pierce County and we, we, we care about them, we want them to be sustainable, and if we can help, um, you know, let's do it. So I will be supporting this. Thank you, Ms. Chair. Thank you. Councilmember Denson. Yes, thank you, Chair. I'm, I'm also thrilled to support this today. I remember when I was on Gig Harbor City Council and the county expanded the CARES money to include incorporated Gig Harbor, it made a huge difference. I mean, the, the businesses were so thankful. I, I cannot even tell you, and, and I think it saved a lot of them. I understand that some of our smallest cities, you know, have even fewer resources than, than Gig Harbor has received, for example. So I absolutely think this is, this is justified, and, and I'm really happy to help support um, these smaller smaller communities. I, I will let you know that I did meet just yesterday with probably at least 20 of the downtown businesses in Gig Harbor, and their message to us is that they have not recovered. And it's amazing if you drive through Gig Harbor, all of a sudden you're seeing empty storefronts that I remember seeing back in maybe 2005 and six and seven. It's shocking and there's more to come. Rents have increased a lot. That's, that's a lot of what um, they're blaming it on, as well as just changing, I think, in um, consumer patterns. So, you know, we're kind of troubleshooting what we can do um, in Gig Harbor, and, and I would like to to perhaps come back this fall if there is money left over after the smallest of jurisdictions have had a shot at these funds, if there's still money left over at the end of this year, you know, I'd love to come back and talk to council about maybe looking at that next tier up to 13,000 and to collect, you know, just a couple more of these small communities that are very visibly struggling. But for now, I really appreciate the, um, the extra assistant for our, assistance for our smallest communities. And that's my alarm telling me I have to run to another meeting. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> thank you, Councilmember Denson. Um, in closing, I want to thank the members in the department who worked on this. We started this program, as has been indicated, in unincorporated Pierce County, always trying to find a way to innovate and help more folks if we can. And so helping our, our smaller communities that often don't have access to resources, uh, that's what this is trying to do. And it's another great example of coming out of the pandemic better than we went into it. What better way? Um, we, you know, we've, we're working a lot on housing and homelessness as examples of coming out of this pandemic better than we went into it. I, I think um, helping our small businesses be more resilient, uh, invest in themselves, uh, redefine themselves, invest in themselves and grow is just another fantastic example of coming out of this pandemic better than we all went into the pandemic. So again, grateful to the members who thought through this um, and the department who continues to bring us some good ideas to invest in. Madam Clerk, will you please call the roll? Yes. Councilmember Morrell? Aye. Councilmember Campbell? Aye. Councilmember Gruber? Aye. Councilmember Denson? Aye. Councilmember Herrera? Aye. Councilmember Hinton? <clears throat> Aye. And Councilmember Mello? Aye. The result of the roll call vote is seven ayes and zero nays. On a vote of seven ayes and zero nays, the ordinance is adopted. That brings us to resolution 2023. Dash 25 for consideration. Councilmember Hitchin for a motion. Thank you, Chair. I'd like to move adoption of R2023-25. Second. It's been properly moved and seconded to adopt resolution 2023-25. Madam Clerk, will you please read? Proposal number R2023-25, a resolution of the Pierce County Council, amending resolution number R2027-137, as amended by resolution number R2018. 147 relating to the council standing and select committees 
and setting an effective date. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Long. Thank you and good afternoon. Uh, the resolution before you uh, would amend two previously adopted resolutions relating to the Council's Standing and Select Committees and to the Committee Rules of Procedure. Uh, so basically there are two categories of changes uh, that this resolution would make if adopted. Uh, the first is to the committee descriptions and the subject area assignments. And these are contained in section A on your exhibit A. Uh, so the changes would be updating the list of subject areas assigned to the various uh, standing committees. Uh, it also makes the assigned subject areas permissive versus mandatory, so replacing shall with may. Uh, this allows some flexibility uh, for the Rules Committee and the Council when assigning subject areas and recognizing that there is some overlap sometimes between the, the committees. And it also revises the name of the current Human Services Committee uh, to the Health and Human Services Committee, and then it makes those changes throughout. The other category of changes would be to the committee rules of procedure, and these are in section C primarily. So it updates terminology to reflect current practice and use. So for example, refers to policy staff versus research or legal staff. We talk about meeting minutes instead of meeting summaries, and we refer to a biennial budget um, under the jurisdictional area of the committee of the whole versus an annual budget. Uh, it updates the actions that can be taken in the absence of a quorum to include receiving scheduled presentations. So sometimes a committee um, finds that it lacks a quorum, but it has um, department folks or outside agencies here to make presentations. It would allow that to continue and not re require that the committee just adjourn. Um, and then it addresses the cable cast requirements. So it makes a few changes to this replaces the term cable cast with broadcast, and this just allows for some greater flexibility, um, recognizing different methods of transmitting uh, committee meetings. Um, it narrows the requirement for cable casting or broadcasting committee meetings uh, from all meetings just to regular meetings. Now, this doesn't preclude cable casting um, any special committee meetings. It just doesn't absolutely require it. Uh, and then finally, it revises the signature requirement on committee reports. Um, this actually reflects current practice where all committee members who are present sign the committee report, uh, and, but the rules currently just uh, provide that the chair will sign, so it just actually reflects current practice. Um, this was heard in Rules and Operations on March 13th and was forwarded to the Council without recommendation. There is one uh, written amendment in your packet, and there is one blank um, on page one, line 28, to fill in for the effective date. And um, my recommendation and staff, I did consult the clerks who are the real worker bees behind getting everything in order uh, for all your committee meetings. And um, it looks like the staff recommendation would be April 24th, 2023, for your effective date. April 24, 2023. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Ms. Long. Are there questions for Ms. Long before we consider the amendments? Not seeing any. Um, Vice Chair Campbell to move committee, uh, excuse me, Council Amendment Number 1. I move Council Amendment Number 1. Second. It's been properly moved and seconded to adopt Council Amendment Number 1. Ms. Long. Thank you. Good catch. I, I didn't make that change from Council or committee to Council. Uh, so uh, this would amend um, your Exhibit A on page 3. It would add under subsection B, select committees, a new select committee on homelessness, and the subject area would be homelessness. So that would be an addition. Thank you. That was my fault, not yours. I, it does say Council Amendment number 1. Oops. My bad. Uh, <laughs> Council Member Vice Chair Campbell. Thank you, Chair, and uh, uh, happy to propose this, uh, something... I've actually been working on a while. Uh, I think if we pull all of us we'll, within our top two items, we'd list homelessness as a top priority uh, that we need to be addressing in this county. And so this will, will allow a select committee, it's usually three members that are gonna be able to do a deeper dive on some policy and help manage the workload that currently, if adopted, the Health and Human Services Committee has, um, being able to help manage that workload, take a deeper dive into some of the issues, um, and really just, uh, uh, another set of 
eyes working on stuff and a, a strong signal uh, to the community that this is a top priority for us. It is one of our committees that we're working on. So with that, I'm proud to uh, sponsor that and bring it forward. Councilmember Herrera. Thank you, Chair. Uh, I, too, uh, support this. Um, it's, it is sending a message to our a community that we do take homelessness seriously and, and looking at the, um, like you said, deep dive, pinpoint focus uh, on this um, homelessness issue that uh, affects us all. Uh, it's, it, we can, we can, our people uh, see it. It's in front of us. And um, I think this will send a great message. So I support this. Thank you. The vote is on council amendment number one. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed nay. The motion is adopted. Vice Chair Campbell for another motion. Uh, sorry. Uh, yes, I move that we um, fill in the blank for effective date and add the date of April 24th, 2023. Second. It's been perfectly moved and seconded to add the effective date in section two of the resolution to be April 24th, 2023. Any further questions or comments on this oral amendment? I'm not seeing any. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed nay. The motion is adopted. That brings us to a public hearing on resolution 2023-25, the council standing and select committees uh, procedure. Anyone in the audience wishing to provide comment on this resolution? Not seeing any. Ms. Persons, anyone online? For any member of the public wishing to make public comment, press the raise hand icon in Zoom or star nine on your telephone keypad. Not seeing any, we'll close the public hearing and bring it back to council. Are there any final remarks by council members? Council Member Hitchin. Thank you, Chair. Um, I just want to acknowledge and thank um, Vice Chair Campbell for brainstorming and thinking how we could bring forward more, more work around. Um, I know we'll be working diligently to figure out how we can staff and support this work, um, but um, there's a lot going on in the human services world, just as there is in all of our committees, and we're all trying to do as much as we can, and this allows us to kind of do some of that work. Divide and conquer, right? It's a good way to do things, so appreciate the work. And um, also highlighting when I first joined the council and I looked at what was on the human services committee, I just couldn't really figure it out because there was a lot of stuff that we were doing that wasn't listed. Um, and so... Uh, getting this up to date to reflect what's actually happening in both our public safety committees, human services, economic development, and, and um, community development, it, it's important. It's a way of showing to the community what they should expect to see coming through our committees. And I figured out pretty quickly that the committee work is where a lot of the dialogue and really intense learning goes on for our community. So for those that are engaged in our county and want to know what's going on, that's that's where you go and get the meat and the potatoes, where you figure out what's going on um, as far as the policy work. So appreciate making sure that this reflects what's happening uh, at a policy level. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councilman Hitchin. Um, thank you to Council. Thank you to uh, Ms. Long for helping the, the Council modernize this, uh, this document about how we govern ourselves with our Council Standing Committees and our Rules of Procedure related to our Council Committees. Uh, this very topic was at our February 8th council retreat. And so here we are taking action. Um, I too want to thank Vice Chair Campbell for um, the additional thinking about how we manage the council's workload, especially since there's a real spike in workload and attention as there should be, as there's expected of us with the crisis of homelessness. Um, and hoping we can get the county through this spike uh, in focus um, and uh, be, be able to really get our comprehensive plan in homelessness into a space where we are managing it and truly making sure that homelessness is uh, a, a brief and, and rare occurrence um, when it does happen. So uh, thank you, everyone, for your work on this. With that, the uh, vote is on uh, Resolution 2023-25. Madam Clerk, will you please call the roll? Council Member Campbell. Aye. Council Member Kruger. Aye. Councilmember Denson. Excused. 
Councilmember Herrera? Aye. Councilmember Hitchin? Aye. Councilmember Morrell? Aye. Councilmember Mello? Aye. The result of the roll call vote is six ayes and zero nays. On a vote of six ayes and zero nays, the resolution is adopted. Item number 10 is other business and announcements. Are there any by members? Councilmember Herrera. Thank you, Chair. Just an announcement. Uh, this weekend, April 1st, 90th uh, Daffodil Parade, four cities, one day, rain or shine, <laughs> or snow. <laughs> uh, 10.15 is Tacoma, 12.45 is Puyallup, uh, 2.30 is Sumner, and last but not least, 5 p.m. in Ording. Rain or shine. It's going to be a good day. Uh, other announcements by members. Ms. Long, is there any other business for council th today? Not today, thank you. Thank you. That does uh, bring us to Section 11, Citizens Forum. This is an opportunity for members of the public to provide input to matters that are important to um, Pierce County. So we ask you to come forward, state your name for the record. You have three minutes to make your comments for council. We'll start here in chambers, and then we'll move to Zoom. Hi, it's Erica Snell. Thank you, Chair Mello and Council. Um, I was hoping to speak on the proposal R202341 after um, you guys had talked about the comprehensive community plan, but I, I suppose I missed it. Um, I do have some documentation that I do want to give to you. Specifically, it's to Seattle and their land use for child care centers. What I've been proposing be done in Pierce County, they did take action in Seattle. And on the second page, this must be a day about funding because this is an early learnings grant funding that went out in 2020. And there is a zoomed picture that King County had collectively taken a majority of those funds. So we lost some economical growth in Pierce County because they were able to cap capture a lot of those federal funding. And I believe it's due to the adequacy that brick and mortar can go up for child care. And then I just have a little map of Pierce County that's blown up so you guys can see that and I'll bring that to you. Separating that I, uh, for my public comment, um, I'll go ahead and open to that. Uh, thank you. Oh, go ahead. It's okay. Can, can um, we go still? It, we, we didn't. We're going to set the Us? time to the appropriate time. It's all good. Please, please, please continue. Oh, okay. Um, so for my public comment, thank you, Chair and Council Ryan Millow. I'd like to quote your action behind our words. Taking action comes in many forms. I'd like to speak to myself on how I take action. I must say, in a mode of f flight or fight, I do put on my armor. However, armor doesn't display diplomacy. If I feel unheard, I go to extraordinary measures. However, extraordinary measures don't always display di diplomacy. My consistency and willingness to find solutions to problems set, uh, brought forth to me shows dedication to serve, but not diplomacy. What is missing is gratitude. I have sat through many of your sessions and hear problem after problem by constituents, sometimes blaming and accusing individual counsel on things outside of your control. This must be hard to endure. Contrary, I see counsel going out of their way to recognize all people in their situations. The council shows diplomacy by, act by verbal actions and by listening and then taking action. While my love language is not verbal gratitude, my words are very matter of fact, it is giving gifts or providing solutions to problems. I do not want to attest to any resolution in my public comment and be very clear, I'm only showing my gratitude to the council for recognizing the people of Pierce County as I have yet to see a constituent do so. And I have just brought you some gift bags. So if it's okay, it's not of a monetary value that would, um, be transgressional to your position, but I think this would provide my gratitude and show diplomacy because I have been pretty strenuous with my words and very consistent, and that can be annoying, but it's all just for the greater good of making our communities better. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Snell. Um, is anyone else in chambers wishing to provide comment during Citizens Forum? Not seeing any, Ms. Persons, anyone online? For any member of the public wishing to make public comment, press the raise hand icon in Zoom or star nine on your telephone keypad. And first we have caller ending in 075. Hi, this is Roxy Giddings. Thanks for taking my call. I came in late on the ORCA thing and I just wanted to say that uh, 
I think that the tribes should have inherent rights to the salmon and uh, see as how they're called the salmon people. Um, and we have dirtied up the Salish Sea and the lakes and continue to dirty the lakes and the rivers and the streams and so on as uh, white people. Um, we have messed it all up and, and uh, so um, we have not given them their inherited rights. Uh, and so I think we should declare some kind of a, an inherent right to the tribes. And um, I was also thinking about the uh, wait, well, never mind, that's enough. Thanks anyway, that's it. Thank you. No one else online and uh, no other members of the public wishing to provide comment in chambers and seeing no other business before council, we will stand adjourned.